All right, this is Todd Atkins, and I'm here with Miguel Adorati. I'm in the Philippines, Miguel, in Costa Rica. And uh, we're going to do MMA Conspiracy Hour. This is going to be more like we're going to go over a number of topics. And uh, before we start, as always, uh, check out Live to Fight Design, our sponsor. Um, you can use my promo code, which is Todd Atkins. Check them out at Instagram at Live to Fight Design. If you order a fight banner or gym banner, you get $20 off your order. And Miguel, I kind of want to start out with what just happened, which is Diaz versus Paul. I want to ask you, okay, what do you think? How does Diaz look coming out of this? How does Paul look coming out of this? Um, Diaz looks, I don't know, about $10 million richer. Right? And that's, I think, the bottom line for Nate on this, you know. Um, I don't, I don't think, I, I think Nate is, a, you know, a guy that if anybody was like born to fight, it was this kid, you know, like, because I remember seeing him when he was 16 fighting, you know, and he always put a lot of spirit and emotion into his fights. And I didn't really see that here. I, I, I saw more like he was, now, you know, it, and, and he said it too, boxing competition, it's not a real fight. So, I don't think you had him as motivated. And I think that's the problem with this type of gimmicky fight here is that the money being generated, you know, isn't going to the best technical fighters. It's going to the most, the, the people that make the most noise. And Nate realized that. Nate, he, he, he got knocked down in the fight, but I don't think he was in any danger. You know, in the post-fight press conference, actually, he was interesting. Interesting cat. He always has been, you know. But he was like, I, I'm not even cut. You know, the big gloves doesn't even allow him to get cut. And he gets cut a lot in MMA, you know. So, yeah, he, he, he if you think you got, you know, if Nate Diaz didn't feel he's in a trench, he's not going to fight like he's in a trench. You know what I mean? And I think he felt comfortable. I think this was just another a, a, a chance at a payday. Don't get knocked out. I, You know, what I don't like is that – you know, we, I, the Jake Paul circus to me has a Super Bowl halftime feel to it of orchestration in some way, shape, or form. I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this fight was a work or anything like that, but, you know, every single commentary, even MMA fighters, you know, some who have worked with Jake, some of our observers and stuff, everybody on in the buildup over the last week has complimented Jake Paul's incredible power, In, including Nate Diaz. Yeah, yeah, you know, he's got power, you know, but Nate, Nate, Nate's the least complimentary sounding because Nate knows, I think Nate knows, you know, there's a script involved with some of that. Yeah, you know, Dustin Poirier saying, oh, you know, if he hits and he's going out or, you know, things of that nature have been out there in the media. And I think Jake Paul may have power in his one big shot you know, I think, you know, if he's lines his, his, his punch up, you know, he may have some power there. But the totality of his boxing work that I saw against Nate, he lacks power. He doesn't, you know, when he works the body, when he's a little off balance and stuff, his shots have no sting. And that's what I think at, by the end of the fight, you had Nate sort of walking him down a little bit. And then, you know, the thing I could, you could tell that this guy Nate didn't really take it seriously. It's like I, Nate toys with his opponents, and he did in this fight, but it's not. It wasn't the same kind of toy, you know. I mean, he puts his opponents down and embarrasses them sometimes. And again, there's almost like a, a an attempt at not embarrassing or not speaking bad about Jake, or everybody is sort of on the same program of promoting this guy. And that's what I don't like about this whole circus. What we see next from him, who knows? Um, I, I've offered the idea that the boxing community should, you know, make sure that he never beats a, a real professional boxer because I think that that would be, you know, a good line to draw. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still not impressed. And I think Nate's a lot richer for it. And I don't think you lose. I think at the end of the day, you've heard what he's going to say. He, he couldn't get up for this. Like, it's not a real fight. It was a boxing competition.
Those are his words. Right. The thing I want to know is, like, going into the fight, was Jake Paul supposed to finish Nate Diaz? How does he look at the end of this with his performance? You know, analyzing it like a normal person, I would say Jake sort of needed to win because he's coming off a loss, you know, and you don't want to put, you know, losses together in anything, especially in what I think he's trying to do, which is, you know, take steps up, you know, kind of shortcut steps up, you know, take a short path up the ladder, shoot like a rocket, not, you know, a gradual build. So I think he want, he's still the wants big fights and wants to impact that. And, and, you know, dropping two fights in a row would be devastating to that effort, I think. So he needed to win. Um, and like I said about his power, that, you know, Nate's the most sophisticated fighter he's fought. And, you know, Nate wasn't going to get knocked out in that fight. I don't think he was. He got dropped one time. He was never in any danger. And um, like I said, Jake is not this is bad boxing that we're watching. This is, you know, semi-professional boxing that we're watching. So it's, you know, after Terrence Crawford and Naoya Inouye's performances last weekend, you know, the top pound for pound boxers in the world showing why, you know, to fall back to this as a boxing main event is an embarrassment for the sport. It, it's a, a semi-professional's fighting, but for what it was, you know, so Jake Paul's a semi-professional. I think he's got one power punch. He's managed to land in a few fights against semi-professional boxers and but lacks power in his overall attack. And, you know, we'll see who he picks as his next opponent. Yeah, did he have to just win or did he have to stop Diaz? Um, I think even, you know, Jake thinks he's doing the right thing you know, to make fighting bigger and, you know, get paydays out there and also make himself bigger and, and the whole thing. He thinks he's doing the right thing and he had a lot of respect for Diaz, I think. And like I said, Diaz is the most sophisticated fighter that he's fought. You know, even in just boxing, you know, Diaz knows more boxing than any of the other guys, maybe short of Anderson Silva. But, you know, he's in the neighborhood. Pure boxing, because Anderson, I think, always mixed it up, you know. Um, so I think it, getting to the end, not getting finished, winning on the judges' cards and stuff, I, I think uh, that doesn't do him any harm. It's not like people are like, oh, that was boring or whatever. I think, they, you know, it didn't do him any harm. I think the knockout, and, you know, celebration afterwards and, you know, and something like that would have made a nice highlight package for him and he probably would have gotten, you know, something more, you know, a million more views or, you know, whatever – you know, you quantify at that level. But, I, I, yeah, I don't think his star has been heard. I think we're now waiting to see where, what direction he heads for his next opponent. Now, they're saying, at least that they've agreed in theory, to fight in the PFL. What would that do for PFL if they actually went through with it? Nothing. I, I'll tell you why. <laughs> And I've mentioned it before. Look, it, it'll get some eyes on the PFL. And then, you know, they did something smart, like a week or two later, gave us Nganu's, you know, uh, debut against whoever, you know, supposedly, where, where are we still waiting for that opponent? I thought we were going to get that sometime soon. I thought there was a big announcement coming. I guess I'm still waiting, but okay. So, you know, if they deliver something big, they got to follow up with something big. And then they got to follow up with something big. And then they got to follow up with something big. And I just don't see that staying power or roster or even an attempt at that type of strategy. But I, I point back to this, you know, the UFC after Griffin and Bonner, which is, you know, a landmark fight, the very next week had Couture, uh, Chuck Liddell two on pay-per-view. That's follow a week later, bam, another major fight, major, major you know, nothing you know, short of, and, and I'm sure that the, the week after that or the next show after that, there was two weeks or whatever, was also something calculated. So random acts of like, yeah, we're going to get, you know, Jake Paul to come and fight in the PFL. Nate, in his post-fight press conference, I think he got 
you know, Jake Paul diving in a little bit. At one point, caught him in a guillotine and let it go, you know. And he also said, oh, he went, you know, he came in. I got easy to take him down, easy to submit this guy. He, he doesn't see it being a real fight. So he'll go do it. But I also heard Nate revealing a little bit of, of what I think I know, and that is that um, a little bit of the street thug is, is come out of them, and they are they are a little bit of like the Diaz brothers as a corporation too, because he's promoting his MMA stuff, and he said, yeah, I'll do the PFL fight. Yeah, you know, I'll fight him. It doesn't scare him. Um, and he mentioned co-promoting with his production. And, you know, the PFL shouldn't do that. The UFC would never, you know, would never. I mean, Mayweather and McGregor, you know, this is the, begun, the money became so big that even Dana decided to play ball and grab nine figures out of there for him and the company, you know? So unless, you know, you're going to hit with astronomical numbers, it doesn't, value your company the pfl to brand themselves with a smaller company unless they're going to go for it forever but you know nate's got a few fights left they can bring him in retire him he can own the company you know none of it really and nate's too independent to do that you know so yeah i i think it'll be a blip on the radar now they did announce amanda serrano is going to be part of their uh Super fight uh, portion of the PFL. What what do you think about that? You know, there are a lot of fighters like Amanda, you know, and Ganu, um, that when the opportunity presents themselves to get paydays that are different than the ones you've been getting. And women's boxing, you know, is among... Is the, the women boxers are very poorly paid, extremely poorly paid. So so much so that I believe the WBC installed um, a law in their bylaws that uh, a women's world title fight had to be made by the promoters with a minimum of a ten thousand dollar purse. Understand what I'm saying there? Ten thousand dollars may pay the rent two months, right? So they're extremely lowly paid. And Amanda's putting a lot of work. Um, and Amanda has some crossover, uh, you know, charisma that could help her. And she deserves to cash in at every portion. So she should grab her money, boo-boo, as they say. You know what I mean? But will Amanda Serrano being signed by the PFL mean anything in a war with the UFC? They're not in this war yet. There's no war. There's no, the UFC is, you know, all they need to fight off the PFL at this point is fly repellent. They really are not concerned with Ngannou's big fight. They've already sort of dropped the ball in the presentation of that as we've gone over. And, um, you know, Amanda Serrano isn't going to be that crow. They, they were talking this week, they were talking about bringing Ronda back. Amanda doesn't move the needle like that. So, yeah, it's a piece in the puzzle. But I see their acquisitions, um, you know, kind of woefully uh, uh, made to get little spl splashes like this, like a headline, Amanda Serrano and stuff. Okay, but who's she going to fight? What else does your roster look like? Do you have 15 people in that weight class? You know, what's the competition look like? What are you providing there? Or it's just, you know, we're going to throw in super fights. So, yeah, the PFL at this point is stumbling in my book. And, you know, I think I, uh, if you're following this podcast, I suspected that it would be so. We're just not getting enough information. We just get little headlines like this, you know, like a clerk sending out mass emails. And, you know, that's the end of the job. And that's not enough. And that's what I see, you know, the Amanda. So, like I said, for Amanda, as much money as you can grab with both fists, please go do it. You know, and they did have Clarissa's Shields, but, you know, after she lost to Abby Montez, we haven't seen her. Yeah, you know, Clarissa Shields though, can't fight Amanda because of weight class. They're going to be in, in very different weight classes. And, again, this is one of those things where 
with Clarissa Shields and um, uh, Kayla, was it Kayla Harrison? The, uh, I, I, I may be yeah. getting her name slightly wrong and I apologize because she deserves more respect than getting her name wrong. Um, that, but that super fight was a very novel and good idea. But an example of what I'm talking about is when it fell apart, they really had nothing to move to the table. They would have ran with that super fight build up for the whole tournament, and then they were left with not much after that because their plans fell through. That's, you know, that's they, they needed to have other fights, other opponents, comparable, and also, like, they now think they're going to do a super fight league. They need to have other storylines going on so that if one fails, like Clarissa Shields and the other, you have two different fighters stepping into the spotlight, and Kayla Harrison could have taken a step back, but they had no choice because they, they don't have the weapons. They don't have the roster. They don't have the matchup. Now, before we put the subject down, you know, I've had confirmation from pretty high up that this announcement is going to be PFL and Bellator merger and that they're moving to another distributor. If that does happen this month, what do you think of that? Uh, it all depends on what that distributor is. Because... That means that Viacom is unloading Bellator and that the Viacom channels where Bellator is shown will probably no longer show MMA. You know, they may keep that if they can. And then what does the PFL bring? Where do we watch PFL today in the United States? So is the PFL going to ink a new deal with somebody? Did they convince a big player to come aboard and give them time? Because this is what's going to happen. Again, I, I sound like a broken record, but these things are as simple as this. If they're going to tell me that they've signed with a TV station exclusively, and they've got one TV station, and the TV station has influence over the calendar, then they're, then they're not a player. Because as you can see, Dana... If you, if you don't have a channel, you know, if you don't have a, a play, if your channel doesn't want to show it, Dana's show, he'll go to, you know, the fight night shows, which will be on, he has, you know, but he, he has deals for all his shows and all facets so that they can deliver weekly content. So if their channel gives them, and they come out and say, look, we're going to have to do a show a week, 52 shows a year, because that's the only way we can compete with the monster of the UFC. We've got to have a roster of about 500 people and keep them busy, keep them working, and do this for a few years in order to establish ourselves. Because these little half steps and then a month between press conferences and stuff, it looks more like a joke than like you're seriously going to address the UFC. The guys who at least have more of a serious idea of like, you know, is one, but, you know, world politics to be a company from – the other side of the world coming over to the States and things. And, and again, they, they produced one show in this country and have a second one planned. They're not there yet. I think they probably understand what it's going to take to do the UFC because they have some, you know, old time fight knowledge in their core, but one's not close. And I think the PFL is much further behind one. That's my assessment of the, of the thing until the PFL shows me something different besides stumbling out of the blocks. Okay. Now I know you're big time in the boxing, especially historically. I want to ask you about Crawford and Spence. What was your uh, take on that? You know, I think Crawford is getting to the point that you could say, you know, unfortunately, you know, he's got 40 something fights at this point. So you're never going to be in a true comparison with guys like Sugar Ray Robinson with a hundred and something, you know, hundreds of fights. But I think talent wise, he's about as close as we're going to get. I think he's the best, you know, I think if, if you, if, I think he's a far better boxer than Mayweather. Mayweather may have defense over him a little bit. Terrence doesn't need as much defense with offense like he has. 
and you know he breaks people down. He's, he's a seamless. You know, I I I don't recall somebody going from you know southpaw to orthodox in around at almost a hectic pace, so smoothly too. At some point, you know, Crawford's a special talent. Crawford is is one of the most talented things in, in the fighting game that I've ever seen. A little bit of a mean streak, you know, a little bit of a us versus the world attitude. Um, yeah, I, I think he's the total pack. I, I think there was a point where after Mayweather retired, that Chocolatito was the number one guy. And that was kind of like, you know, I think boxing, you know, getting together and trying to get the lower weight classes some, you know, much needed attention. I think you had Andre Ward there. But I think since Ward retired and Chocolatito went down a little bit, there's no question in my mind that Terrence Crawford's been the number one pound for pound guy since. You know, you go back in lightweights and, you know, they don't look like much now because the Cubans were burnt out and stuff. But you, know, you dispatch your Yorkist Gamboa as a world champion, as a gold medalist, dispatched him at a lightweight class and now at welter, you know, many pounds up. He, 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 he Spence, he, he showed the old saying, their levels to this game. Spence is at the top of the pyramid in this sport. And, you know, standing atop of him on the net, very, at the point of the pyramid is, is Crawford. He's the best. Let me ask you about another fight, because I don't think we talked about this, which is the new Ian Fulton. You know, the new he stopped Fulton as well. What do you think about that? Oh, you know, in a way, is, is probably number two on that list right now. You know, you can count maybe Usyk in there. Um, and that's your top pound for pound guys. You know, uh, uh, Fulton. Do so you put Usyk ahead of Fury? Um, on a pound for pound list, like I, Fury might be Usyk. Like that might be my pick. But on a pound for pound list, my thought is that I reward the widest range of technique. And Fury's close because Fury is a very sophisticated guy and, and very much. Uh, but, um, you know, Usyk moves a lot like Lomachenko. And when you factor in that he's a heavyweight, what he does is in, in precision and with, with what he has, is remarkable in my book. I think we are actually gifted with two of the more technically beautiful heavyweights like Muhammad Ali, like that, guys like that. And Tyson Fury has only very recently become that in my body, you know? But those are the guys. Inoue beat Fulton, knocked him out, and, you know, was going up in weight to capture a guy who had every title, you know, and now he's like a, a bunch of weight division world champion. And he's still going to probably go up another weight class. Um, so we, yeah, in a way, he's in the conversation. But you know, if he, I, I just, I, if I had to pick one man to win a fight to save my child's life, I might pick Terrence Crawford. Yeah, that's interesting. Now I want to ask you. I know we talked about like. Uh, Gaethje and Poirier, maybe, I know you didn't see the fight. We watched the highlights of it. There was, you know, Gaethje obviously knocked Poirier out. But really what we wanted to focus on was the fact that McGregor challenged him after the fact for a, a shot at the BMF title. What do you make of this latest McGregor challenge? You know, we, we've dwelled, you know, we've done particular podcasts, actually, on the McGregor subject. So... Um, I urge fans to look back and me and Todd have gone into this in detail, but um, to sum it up here, uh, I think that, you know, Connor is lo looking again, like a substance abuser in this situation where, you know, he's trying to be the center of attention where this was Gaethje's moment and he inserts himself and by virtue of him being him, it becomes news. And that's the buzz he likes. Would he actually be able to fight Gaethje and, and you know do a training camp like we need to to fight that guy? 
you know, at this point, that's where he's been failing. He's been healthy since, you know, the leg recovery. And we should have probably have seen him in the ring already, except for little things like, you know, he's not following any of the protocol that any of the other fighters on the roster are following. So until he actually seriously signs, you know, into a, a fight, like Gaethje said, you know, let's do this. If you're going to do it, start going through the process because, you know, USAD is going to block you. And it, yeah, it looks like he's pushing in to get the center of attention after a great fight by two guys that, you know, are at the top of the game right now. Yeah, and I don't understand why he does it. He, he's already, you know, as famous as he needs to be. He already gets attention. This isn't a case of like, I know you don't want to talk about Dylan Dennis, but Dylan Dennis is a guy who would need to try and get himself attention. Connor doesn't need to stay relevant. He is relevant. He's Conor McGregor. I don't see why he needs to do this. Yeah, it, it, the, the problem is, is you do you have what you have here is you have his ego is run amok. You know, even even Muhammad Ali, you know, had a custom auto or you know, Tyson had a custom. You, you have to have someone you respect that controls you. And you know. We mentioned it here, his trainer at this point doesn't want to assert himself in that same way. And I don't blame him because I think it would go wrong because I don't think McGregor is open to being guided by an older, wiser figure. Hey, you shouldn't do that. You know? Hey, maybe not this time. Hey, the, you know, lay off the whiskey. You've been drunk for four days. You know, it, he... If those types of, he doesn't hear that from anybody. So that's the problem. His wife also, you know, wives can be a dominant force in people's lives, but he's already sort of very publicly, um, you know, not giving her that position. You know, he does what he wants. And that's the consistent message, including to the point where TV production couldn't get him to do what they want. USADA couldn't get him to do what they want. The UFC and the UFC contract couldn't get him to do what he wants. He put himself on TV, not in the USADA testing pool. Therefore, we knew that the fight was never going to happen anyway. But he loved the buzz of being in the center of attention. And, and the thing about it, this fight is, it was for the, you know, of course, in Connor's head, you know, sitting at the bar and, uh, you know, having a couple of whiskeys, you know, he probably thinks he's a pretty bad motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, he thinks he's the BMF. And that's it goes, it's that simple with that type of ego to me. Sure, they they got my belt. And that's how somebody should be like, all right, Connor, you know, technically you're sitting on a you know half a billion dollar empire of money, management, and you know, other concerns and stuff. Let's not worry too much about that crappy, you know, construct the UFC's got going on. It's not like Gaethje and Poirier, I'm sure they're well paid. But they're not at the level of money it should even interest Tom. Like the BMF belt isn't worth, you know, the same. He kind of can fight next fight and make more money. So it's ego. He wants to be the BMF. I can say I got, I got the two weight class belts and I'm the baddest motherfucker. Ah, because he's still at 35 acting like a 25 year. Now, I want to ask you about something that's kind of been controversial in the, since last time we talked, which was, you know, Stephen Thompson not letting the show go on, so to speak. He he makes a weight. Michael Pahea doesn't. You know, he's a big guy anyway. He misses weight by three pounds. Stephen Thompson says, all right, I made weight. I'm not fighting him. UFC says, if you don't fight him, we're not going to pay you, basically. Or they haven't paid him as of today, I think. You know, I go back to the old days of MMA in the 90s. And I believe that paying the fighter their show money has always been at the discretion of the promoters, even in the earliest of contracts here. That were, you know, even in the simple age of two or three page contracts. If the fight doesn't go down, you don't get the money. Now, a lot of people give it, including Dana, has been very, you know, because you get a big bump 
in word of mouth. Hey, like these people take care of you. They, they help me out. They, because I, I would let them know. I don't have to pay you, but here's your money anyway. And, and Dana has utilized that a lot. So that's why this looks strange. But I think that, yeah, with the corporation, you know, becoming more and more of a corporation, less and less of fight people around. Dana wasn't there for this one on vacation, right? So a lawyer read the contract and said, hey, we don't have to pay him. I think that's probably a simplest, you know, at the simplest level, I think that's what's going on here. And Thompson may be able to get to Dana's ear and ask Dana, and Dana may pay him because that's sometimes what happens here. But I do think Thompson made a mistake. I think he may overrate his position with the company. Um, I don't think he's like, you know, one win away from a title shot. I think he's got to do some work still. And I think he may be past his title shot times, which means you fall into a certain category with the UFC, a three pound weight loss. Yeah, great. The guy's big, et cetera, et cetera. But to just say no and leave the company without the chance to replace, you know, not on after post weigh-ins, you know, and, um, you know, I, I think he made a, a little bit of a career mistake to not take the fight, unless there was a, a reason I'm not seeing, but just the guy didn't make three pounds and he's big. I won't do this. He knew that. Bottom line is, is if he goes in and wins and takes the percentage from Pereira's purse that he would be due because the guy didn't make weight, he would go home with the biggest possible payday that he could. So I think you made a, a, a business uh, bad read in not taking that fight. No, I think maybe they should. There's some confusion in the terminology, though. The fighters and fans show money. I showed up. I made way. I should get paid. Maybe they should call it like fight money. You fought. You didn't win, so you got paid for fighting. Win money as you get paid for winning, you know. So I think maybe they should change the name of it or something, because I think that's where the confusion lies. He showed up. You know, Showing the, the, doesn't mean you have to fight. He, this, this is one <laughs> of those type situations because the blame here, the problem, the core root, the root cause of this problem is Pereira not making weight. If Pereira does his job and makes weight, then Thompson doesn't even have the. A good, you know, you have to just pull out of the fight, and then yeah, you certainly not get paid, right? So, you know, was he looking for an out? I, I, I that's why I, I don't know why you don't take the fight because they give you some of your opponent's pay as compensation as well. I know Thompson made I'm, more power to him. He's made decent money. He's not hurting for that kind of paycheck. Not willing to get in the ring. You know, maybe he's thinking about I got three or four fights left in my, you know, maybe. But I think he just did a full training camp. And just was it, I, I, I would almost think if the UFC decides to not pay him, that it wouldn't surprise me. And then he, he will be asked to fight, you know, then he'll want to fight again real fast and he'll never pull this again. And that may be the message they want to send to everybody. Yeah, exactly. Because, because, like I said, three pounds, you know, is not uh, an extreme amount. You know, and, uh, of course, the guy's big, so he was going to be 25 pounds bigger, you know. But Thompson bulks up a little too. And Thompson's a long-time pro. You know, you do the fight. Unless there's a, a reason of injury, which he shouldn't have been there then in the first place. Um, maybe, you know, at the end of the day, he analyzes it and thinks it is an unfair advantage for his opponent. I, you know, Thompson, I'd have to respect that out of him because he's such an established guy, too. And he's got his way of doing things he didn't see. Uh, he thought he might be in more danger and that the guy would come in maybe more bouncy and big and didn't want to chance it. A lot of guys chance it, you know. And so that's where I think at the end of the day, Dana might not step in and help him. And that will be interesting to follow. You can, you know, you get them your money, you did the whole training camp. That's where, you know, the, you have to spend your money on paying for your training camp a lot of the time, too. So, you know, telling them up, you're not getting anything hurts. And that's, you know, been a long time thing that Dana has always managed, 
you know, at times by helping out, you know, and, and doing the right thing kind of thing. And we'll see if the corporation now, uh, you know, will lose that. Because they, and for all the knocks on Dana, Dana did show up and say, you know, I, I, I've heard a story where Mark Schultz, who fought once in the UFC, is an Olympic wrestler and an icon, but um, Dana paid for his teeth. You know, for because he was beginning that problem, dental problems, and Dana, you know, got him a new. And told him, I said, you, you know, I respect what you did. He just paid for it. Dana was of that nature, and now this would be a sign that um, the lawyers have taken over. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if, because uh, you're right, they they have that history of okay, we'll take care of you. You know, kind of the old school take care yeah. of fighters when it comes to that kind of thing. I don't think there's ever been an instance where they wouldn't pay a fighter their show money if they made weight. But now yeah, they, this is blatantly public. We're not going to pay you. And that would be yeah. a uh, kind of like a turn of course. Yeah. Like I tell them fighters, you're going to fight whether your opponent makes weight or not, or or you don't have to fight, but we won't pay you if you don't. Yeah, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, Bill Clinton. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. You know, a lawyer says that because he defines sexual relations as actual intercourse, and that's not what happened, right? But it's semantics. So lawyers look at it, things the way they want. A lawyer looked at this contract and said, you know, we're not obligated to pay him. That's going to be hard for somebody to step in and, 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 and they, they, they may, we may be looking at a new protocol here. You may be, yeah. um, you know, how much weight does your opponent have to miss by for it to be sort of acceptable for you to say, no, I don't want to do the fight? Because that's what's changing here. You know, if, if Thompson, three pounds, again, the lawyers are like, yeah, you know, you should have done it, which is, I think, what's going on. It's like, it's not that much weight. And you're talking about a guy who's a longtime pro. He should probably have done the fight, is my gut feeling. But that's the status quo. You know, that's what he was thinking that they may give him the respect of, okay, you don't have to do the fight because the guy didn't make weight. But enough people have jumped on taking the extra money and not going there that, it, it, it Thompson doesn't look great in this. I think what it is is if the commission's willing to let the fight go forward, because they're the ones that decide how much of the miss is not appropriate. So if it's within their guidelines, you have to fight or not, but you won't be paid. And that would be an interesting change, of course. Yeah. I, you know, I'd have to look up examples of guys who you know, turn down a fight when their opponent didn't make weight and, you know, how many of them got paid. It's never been a public issue that, you know, we've heard of. So we assume they got their show money at the very least. You know, you hear stories that show money went out and things. Um, and the business kind of monitored, you know, as it grew and it was smaller, people kept an eye on stuff like that. You know what I mean? Across the board. So um, you knew Dana was usually got a guy that would, help the fighter out. But we may be looking at a new policy for the UFC because their contract allows them to do this, I assure you. Now, the last thing I kind of want to talk about was Tony Ferguson. You know, we saw him kind of... The reason I want to talk about this is, you know, he's he didn't look good against Nate Diaz. I, I thought that fight was really difficult to watch for both of them. And in this fight, you know, he's a ground... I would say his ground is his strong point, and he got submitted by Bobby Green. So, have we seen the last of Tony Ferguson, or do you think the UFC is going to let him go go forward? I, you know, I'm I'm not I'm confident that if we leave this up to Tony, Tony will fight again. That that seems to be his, uh, you know, he's he's a guy that enjoys and has devoted himself to this a lot. And I, I worry about, you know, the fighters making, you know, how you make the call when you're near the end. I think he's a very deteriorated fighter from his top. You know, he, he'll go down in history as a guy. What do you have, like a nine fight winning streak? Right. So if that's the case, then why didn't he get a title shot six fights into that streak? 
because he was put on hold for McGregor, could be, or, you know, he didn't, he met, the, and then when he finally did, got the Khabib signing, it just never worked out in terms of, he, he was already starting to show some mileage and get banged up. So, I worry about the fighters 20 years from now, and I think Tony's putting a lot of miles, and, you know, we don't know what he's going to look like in 20 years, but it could be, you know, with a broken down body and things like that, if you let him keep going, perhaps already, but if, if you let him keep going, you know, the signs are, are there, and you can't ask the fighter, do you want to fight again? Because the answer will probably be yes. There's got to be, I think, the commissions and the doctors that work with the commissions have to have some kind of organized process of, of reviewing this stuff. Yeah, well, Miguel, I think, uh, you know, this, uh, one thing I did want to kind of close the show on is uh, let you kind of talk about the the stuff that you're working with as far as the, the rescue goes. Woo! And the well, collectors, the collector's channel as well. Yeah, you know, we're cruising right along with our uh, MMA podcast, MMA Museum podcast with interviewing people. I got uh, this Wednesday, uh, whatever Wednesday is, August 9th, I believe. Um, we've got a very interesting interview with uh, MMA pioneer Amanda Buckner. Um, and, uh, you know, she was part of an MMA couple where her husband logged a lot of fights. I, he didn't make the UFC kind of thing, but he was a very gritty fighter in the 90s and in the early days. So I actually got to interview both of them together about their careers and things. And uh, very, very interesting couple. And uh, that's what's next on, on the MMA Museum podcast. The reason that's a good segue to the dog stuff is that, you know, Jay, Jack, and Amanda Buckner, uh, they both own pit bulls and work with dogs as well. And uh, up in Maine, uh, where they live now. And uh, I started, you know, looking into this type of, you know, helping animals and things about five years ago, really, um, down in Costa Rica, where I've been living, you know, the situation sometimes you see animals that are strays and you see situations and things where there are animals in distress on the street. And most human human beings want to help, but they just can't, you know? An older lady might want to help, but you know, what's she going to do? Take the dog into her house? People start to get a little scared. Or what's she going to do? Chase dogs around in the street, you know, giving them food and things. So people want to help and people have a lot of sympathy for them, but it's actually saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take the step and actually be the guy that helps the animals that's on, on the ground. It's risking getting bit and the whole thing. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that. It's actually the most rewarding work I've, I've ever had because like the beginning of the podcast, I think you got a little snippet of the pit bull that came up to me. I mean, that pit bull lived on a chain for two years and was a fifth of the weight that he is now when he came into the shelter. So you, you get, you know, real powerful stories like that. And to me, you know, you get a lot of tragedies too. The ones you can't help, they all hurt. So um, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I moved out of my inner city house where I lived in, in the city in Alajuela out to the boondocks kind of. And uh, now I have like, more property and space and things like that. And I'm near a shelter I've been working with. And, uh, you know, it's time to take this thing to the next level. Yeah, you see a lot of that out in the Philippines, too. You see a lot of just strays and uh, yeah, stray dogs, yeah. stray goats. <laughs> you you know, know. They, they, in the Philippines, you know, sometimes, you know, I know they have a lot of strays and they have a lot of, you know, people care, you know, the same thing, rescues and things like that. At the end of the day, there's also a portion of the population that eats dog. And, you know, people are turned off by that. But let me tell you that even in the United States, like the situation in Texas with dogs, where a, a person may not be able to keep their pet, so they take their dog to the shelter. And that dog has three days before it's euthanized. Three days. Yeah. So if, if a dog is going to die like that, given up by his owner, which 
you know, you would have to really convince me. It, just, just the old, the dog's getting older. I can't handle it or anything like that. These are not good excuses to abandon your animal. But people use them, and they do. In, in those, killing an animal in a, in a shelter after three days, I could almost argue that them being used for food consumption is actually a better way to go. And and the the, the problem with the food consumption things too is that it comes with an aspect of hideous cruelty. So at the end of the day. The dogs are victims everywhere. The animals are victims everywhere. And that's why I think that I want to dedicate what I got left on this planet to helping that cause, because I think it's a, a noble cause. And I think that the, the love an animal gives you is very pure. Uh, you know, I, I was away from these particular dogs for a few weeks and just their reaction when they came back in you know, let me, they remember you, they know me, and they, they, they care for me. And, um, you know, sometimes you don't even get that kind of empathy from humans, right? So um, that's yeah. what's going on with the dog rescue. I'll, I've got a GoFundMe going on. It's kind of stalled because of my move. I haven't done anything with it. But if anybody could even throw $5 on there, it would be a big help. Um, and particularly these dogs are going to have to, they, they still require training. Um They've received tr extensive training already to, to the point where the budget has allowed. And um, yeah, they, they need a little more help. They just fought over a plate of food, you know, and that's the kind of thing where it's like, you can't have dogs fighting, you know? So it's like the training still needs work. And it's a never ending job. It's a never ending job. If, if, if I had an endless pit of money, I'd probably be out rescuing the dog right now because they're out there in the streets in need now, we, uh, you know, because of resources, places to stay, you know, this, that, the other thing. I, you know, you can't save them all. That's the tragedy. And that's the Wet Nose Project. Go find me, right? The Wet Nose Project is uh, on Facebook. That's uh, the shelter that's down here. And uh, we're working on, on narices humedas, which is wet nose in Spanish. And, uh, you know, having a, a dual presence on the internet and, and things like that, just to, you know, try to advance the cause a little bit. So we'll put Miguel's uh, GoFundMe in the, in the show notes here, if you guys want to check it out. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that too here in the Philippines. The dogs don't just come up to you. Yeah. You know, like they do, you know, they don't necessarily want your back. They just run away, you know. The sad part about the Philippines compared to where I am is that, you know, my, this country, Costa Rica, is 4 million people. You know, Philippines is a much more populated country, which means that there are much more stray dogs. Just simple as that. You know, so uh, I'm sure that you'll see some things there that, you know, will move you. Because you know the, the animals do suffer. And, uh, you know, hey, like I said, five dollars on the gold fund. You have no idea how much that would help, and uh, you know, in the long run. So well, that's my new project, my new life. All right, Miguel. Well, it's always great talking to you, and uh, everyone's forced in and make conspiracy hours always. Appreciate you guys watching, and uh, until the next episode, take care. Thank you, sir.